Uh, Christopher is an English-born writer and philosophy professor based in Missoula, Montana. He has written on topics related to wildlife, environment, climate, and technology for several publications, including The Atlantic, Orion, Smithsonian, the BBC, and the Wall Street Journal, and various other outlets. And I'm just going to end this there and hand over to Christopher for his presentation. The stage is yours, Christopher. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I appreciate it. And thanks everybody for coming out, um, though when it's on Zoom, it's really staying in. So thanks everybody for staying in. Um, wanted to start by just saying where I grew up and where I live now, just to, uh, I guess, <clears throat> clarify why my accent is part British and, and part American. I grew up on the south coast of England in Seaford, Sussex, and that is right on the edge. Some of you will know this right on the edge of South Downs National Park. It's literally a five minute walk from where my parents live. A uh, beautiful place. Uh, it wasn't a park where I, when I grew up, but it's been made a park since. And the Cookmere Haven is a place I still love to visit. Um, but I live now in this place called Missoula, Montana. And this is four and a half thousand miles to the west. Uh, we're in the Northern Rockies. We're pretty close to the Canadian border up there. Um, strangely, we're actually a little south of Seaford. Uh, our climate is, a much, is much colder, uh, but we're a little south of, of where I grew up. So I'm talking to you today from Missoula, Montana, where we still have a little bit of snow up on the mountains around us. We had snow fell about a week ago. Um, so we're one of the few parts of the United States right now that's not under a massive extreme heat warning, which everybody else is suffering under. But I'm going to start this uh, talk not in England or in the United States, but I'm going to start it in northern Norway. And I'm going to start by just a little 30-second uh, read of a passage from my book, Tenacious Beasts. Standing on the dock in the dead of Arctic winter, Sven Anders closed his eyes to the northern lights above. All the professor wanted to do right now was listen. As the mountains and green aurora faded from his retina, the sound of a gently rippling ocean washed over his body. Seconds after his mind quieted, he heard the splash of a large object, followed by a fierce exhalation of air. Then he heard another, then another. A fishy scent wafted shoreward. Casting his head back to the sky, Shvenaz's his mouth cracked open as he drank in the frigid nighttime air. He was perched on the doorstep of whales, dozens and dozens of whales, humpback and killer whales, drawn to Norway's Cal Fjord in the winter months to feast on herring. So this guy, Sven Anders, is an environmental philosophy professor like I am. That's, that's how I know him. And he lives in Arctic Norway, right at the top where Norway bends around and starts heading towards Russia. And for five years, there was a massive influx of humpback whales in the bay, in the fjord near where he lives. I have another friend up there uh, who has a house on the fjord and she told me that traditionally she liked to sleep every night of the year with her windows open. So this was some kind of Arctic Norwegian craziness, I guess. Um, but when these whales were in, she says, I couldn't leave my windows open because I couldn't sleep. There were so many whales. So this was a super abundance of humpback whales and they were in these fjords after the herring that were uh, what they were feeding on. And what this represented is a massive increase in that North Atlantic population of humpback whales. So that North Atlantic population hit a low of about 1,000, 1,200 animals around about the 1960s. Uh, and it's now up to, depending on who's doing the counting, it's up to 35,000. Closer to where I live in the North Pacific up here, the low there was about 1,200 and it's now up to 24,000. And in the Western Indian Ocean, the low for humpback whales was around 600 and it's now up to 30,000. So humpback whales are a species of least concern, according to the IUCN. They have recovered pretty much to pre-exploitation numbers. So having been reduced 95%, they're now pretty much back to pre-exploitation numbers. So humpback whales are a good example of what I call a tenacious beast. So that's the title of the book. It's the title of the talk. Humpback whales are tenacious beasts. And what makes you a tenacious beast is if you have come very close to extinction, 
and then something changed, maybe a policy, uh, maybe a set of values, something kind of shifted and you've come back. In some cases, you've crawled back very slowly. In other cases, you have just flooded back. And these humpback whales, I think, are a good example of a really successful recovery. So I had been writing before this book, I've been writing a book about technology and the loss of the natural world under technology. And I kept hearing these stories about animals that were coming back. And I thought the loss of the natural world is not the full story. So let's look at some of these animals coming back. So I set out and charted about 12 or 15 animals who've had pretty spectacular recoveries. And I'm just going to run through the species I cover. I organized the book by uh, landscape type. And so I start on farmland in Europe. Uh, and I talk about mainly the recovery of the wolf. So wolves are now up to 19,000 in the EU. Uh, I also mentioned red deer that are up to 2.5 million, wild boar up to 10 million, roe deer up to 10 million. Some pretty impressive recoveries on farmland in Europe. The next section is prairie in the United States. So this is nearer to me. Uh, plains bison were at a low of around 500. They're now up to about 450,000. Uh, I also mentioned pronghorn antelope that had a low of about 13,000. They're now up to a million. I mentioned in this chapter also swift foxes uh, and a couple of other species that are starting to come back on the prairie. So farmland, prairie, rivers. In rivers, I talk about beavers. Uh, in the US, they had a low of about 100,000 and now at about 15 million. I also talk about some salmon species, and it's hard to find salmon that are coming back, but if you go to the right places, and these are typically places where dams have been removed, you find, for example, on the Elwha River in Washington state, coho salmon were down to about 2,000 in 2019. They're up to about 7,000 now. In woodland on the left there is the very rare Marsican brown bear, and on the right is the barred owl. So I talk about the recoveries of both of these species. And then again, oceans, the humpback whale. I talk about the sperm whale. And I also talk about the sea otter. And the sea otter is back from a low of about 1,000 to about 125,000. So amongst all the bad news, there's quite a bit of good news. And you can sort of pick your piece of good news where, wherever you want. Here's a few others uh, that one... Uh, we'll see from time to time, they're doing extremely well. Look at those bald eagles down there. Uh, bald eagles were down to 417 nesting pairs in the United States uh, when they started to be protected in the 60s. They're now up to 71,000. Um, the Northern Elephant Seal at the bottom left there was down to less than 100 animals, and it's now up to 150,000. And so if you keep your eyes open, you will see these recoveries happening from time to time in different places. And actually, I pulled up the BBC website this morning where I get my daily news. And there was a story about the Iberian lynx, which the IUCN has just taken off the endangered status and is now doing better. It's still classified as vulnerable, but it's doing better than endangered. And it's gone from 62 mature adults to around 2,000 Iberian lynx in Spain and Portugal at the moment. So that was today's news uh, on, on the BBC. So there is that good news around. Now, I don't want to uh, mislead anybody and, and make you think that uh, here's a guy who's denying the biodiversity crisis. I mean, the biodiversity crisis is real. There are a million species threatened with extinction. The abundance of vertebrates is dramatically down. So even if you aren't heading for extinction, your numbers have gone down on average about close to 70% since the 1970s. Uh, we hear these bad news about bird populations, about insect populations. The biodiversity crisis is real. So no illusions about this good news that I am uh, sharing with you today. But I think it's worth telling these good news stories. And I'm going to give you three reasons why it's worth doing, why it's important to do it, I think. Uh, I teach undergraduate students, and for a long time, I thought my job was to tell them how uh, dismal the, the prospects for the world are. Uh, you know, I work in an environmental field, and so talking about climate change, talking about biodiversity loss, I thought was very important. But I'm starting to realize now that actually talking about hope is more important. 
talking about ways that people can envision a better future, ways we can do things differently. And so this book is a book about hope. It's about species that have done well uh, and provoke some ideas about how we might uh, widen those success stories. A second reason, and I learned the second reason in the course of writing the book, is that looking at these species doing well is a reminder about how biology works. What do I mean by that? Animals want to live. Uh, evolution has it is set up to allow species to exploit opportunities, have small genetic changes so they get better at exploiting some opportunities and surviving. Animals want to live. And if you think about what happened during COVID, when we all locked ourselves in our houses and pulled back out of various ecosystems, we pulled back animals step forward. There were goats in Welsh villages. Those masks and bears I mentioned were bathing in Italian fountains. There were pumas in San Diego, Chile. Uh, animals want to live, they want to survive, they want ecosystems in which to inhabit. And sometimes if we just give them that chance, they will step right up. And then the third reason, and I'll get to this in the latter part of my talk, is when an animal comes back, we get the chance to see it afresh. Uh, when its numbers were very low, nobody really encountered it. And there were stories about those animals that uh, those, those were the stories that the people who were involved in depleting them told. Now that some of these animals are back, we can have new stories, we can have new advocates, and we can come to understand those animals differently. And so that's a third reason uh, why I thought telling these stories would serve a good purpose. So I'm going to give you uh, a bit of a sense of what I learned in the book by just introducing you to a couple of the the species that I followed here. And one of the things I thought was, okay, uh, here's some species that have come back. What, what do you have to do for a species to come back? So turned out there's not just one thing you have to do. There's various strategies you have to employ. And let me just start with these whales, which I obviously I'm very enthusiastic about them. Um, what you had to do to let whales come back is something uh, that shouldn't really be that surprising. What you had to do was to stop killing them. And quite literally, when the moratorium on the hunting of humpback whales was put in place in the 1960s, and then a wider ban on commercial whaling uh, in the 1980s, you put that in place, the animal comes back. You stop killing it, it comes back. And it's not just true of whales, it's true of bison, it's true of beavers, it's true of wolves. If you stop killing them, they come back. It is that simple. That's the conservation lesson end the killing of the animal, and it starts to recover. Of course, that's the exception. Most animals, again, require a little bit more. And let's talk about this Marsican brown bear. So here we are in the Apennines of Italy. And what these folks are doing is they are pruning apple trees. And they're pruning apple trees so that the trees will be more productive and the bears will have something to eat. And here is a mask and brown bear going up one of those apple trees looking for apples. Now, if you live in a place uh, like where I live, we're told to keep apples away from bears. Uh, we don't want the bears uh, in town messing with our apple trees. There's people that'll pick trees clean of apples here so that the bears don't come into town. But there, those trees were just a little bit out of town. These were often abandoned orchards in the foothills. Uh, and keeping those mask and bears in the foothills is better than letting them come into town where they get involved in chicken coops and beehives, they get hit by cars. But if you can prune the apple trees to produce a fruit in the foothills out of town, those bears tend to survive. So I went out there, uh, I met with um, Mario Cipolloni and Angela Tavoni who work with Salviamo Lorso and with Rewilding Apennines to help these Marsican bears recover. They showed me a lot of the territory. They showed me these trees that they were pruning. Uh, I saw some Marsican bear scratches on the, on the back of a fence post. But of course, when you go looking for wildlife, you never actually see them. They don't show up on demand. But we did see some Marsican bear poop. Uh, it was unbelievably exciting. I have never been as excited about standing next to some scat as I was standing in front of that mask and bear scat. And as Mario was telling me about the scat, he was saying their, their stomachs don't digest, uh, 
They don't have a very strong acid, so they don't digest things very well. You can see the beech nuts and the acorns here that they're eating. You can see some of the berries that they've started to eat. And then he squatted down, picked up two sticks, and brought the scat up towards his face, which was kind of an odd moment, I must confess. But he closed his eyes, took a deep breath in, and he breathed out and his face lit up in a smile. And he said, is like a fine wine. And he was very moved by the aroma of this Marsican bear poop. And it, it, was a, it was a very funny moment at the time. But in follow-up conversation, he expressed to me how culturally important he thought these bears were. Uh, these were not just sort of a wildlife story. This was a cultural story. And the fact that you could have these bears an hour and a half from Rome in these mountains was a great source of pride for him. And it was part of his identity, which I thought was very powerful. Um, and it's a question I think we should all ask, you know, in, in England or in the United States, like what, what animal is part of your identity? What animal, when it's on the landscape, makes you feel a fuller human being? So that was these mask and bears. They were down to 50 for about a century. And then now back up to, they've been waiting to do a genetic count. But Mario, I contacted him recently. I said, you know, what, where are we at? And he said, I think you should feel confident about saying 70, but I think it's probably a little bit more than that. Um, so that's still not a lot of bears, but in, in terms of percentage increase, you know, we're talking about a 40 plus percent increase in the last decade or so. So those bears are tenacious beasts clinging on and making their way back. I want to tell you a quick story about these sperm whales. So these are not the humpback whales. They were not as easy to kill during whaling uh, as the humpback whales were, uh, but their numbers did go down from 2 million to about 500,000. Of course, uh, um, the, the focus of epic stories like Moby Dick. Um, but these bears are coming back now. So they're back from about 500,000 to probably 850,000. And up in Alaska, I chatted to somebody who is doing her best to keep good relations between sperm whales and the fishermen. Because often when a species comes back, it creates a little bit of tension, a little bit of a challenge. Uh, and what was happening here is the, the fishing system in southeast Alaska uh, for bottom fish changed at the same time as these sperm whales started to come back. And let me just get into that a little bit further. The sperm whales, as they were coming back, uh, started, encountering, started encountering more and more longline fishermen who, as the name suggests, they put a long line of baited hooks on the bottom of the ocean. They leave that long line soaking for 10, 12 hours, and then they come back and they reel that line up. So if you can imagine your, your boat shows up at that line after a, a 10 or 12 hour soak, uh, you use a hook to grab the, the buoy, uh, you wrap it around your winch, and you start the hydraulics, and you start cranking that line off the bottom of the ocean up to your boat. Now, these sperm whales have the largest brain of any animal on Earth. And if you're a sperm whale, you hear this noise, and then in front of you, you start seeing this line moving diagonally from the bottom of the ocean up to the surface. And every six or eight foot, if the fishing's good, there is a giant black cod on there or a halibut. And the person explaining this to me, Lauren Wilde, she said, um, imagine if you're the sperm whale, it's like you're in front of a sushi belt just a sushi belt of fish. And the sperm whales figured out they could hook their lower jaw under this line and just gently close the, their mouths over this line. And as the line went through their teeth, when they felt a fish bump against their lips, they would just give it a little kiss and that would pull the fish off into their mouth. And the fishermen observed them doing this and they started calling this flossing. I mean, it is, it's kind of like flossing. Uh, the, the, line was flossing their teeth as the fish went by, but this was not going to end up with good relationships with the fishermen. So Lauren had to figure out, help figure out a solution to this, this problem. They didn't know how to do this. They experimented with a few things, um, flashing bits of metal on the line to confuse the sperm whale's echo location. That didn't work very well. Uh, they tried playing killer whale sounds. So killer whales prey on sperm whale calves, 
So they thought if we can blast out some killer whale sounds underwater, these sperm whales will perhaps not approach the net, the, the lines. That didn't work either. Uh, they thought about electric shocks on the lines, but then they thought, well, wait, these are protected animals. You can't put electric shocks uh, on, the, on your fishing lines. Eventually, they figured out a thing called a slinky pot. And a slinky pot uh, is a way of putting your bait not on a hook, but inside a mesh pot. And this flummoxes the whales. And relationships have stayed positive between the whales and the humans. So here's an accommodation. The whales are coming back on, the, on their own. But in order to avoid that uh, tension and, and that, that uh, hostility from fishermen, they've had to adapt and find a creative solution. Here's a bison. It's not a plains bison from North America. This is a European bison, Bison bonassis. And one of the exciting things for me in writing this book was following this story, which is taking place very close to where my sister lives in Kent, where bison have been uh, brought back into the Bleen Woods. And some of you might have heard of this reintroduction. Some of you might have actually been to see it already. Uh, and I, my sister and I went there, got to know the uh, rangers there. There, were, there was an application for the UK's first two bison rangers and they had 1,200 applicants for those positions. Uh, we got to know the bison ranges and we got to see the first bison return to the Bleen Woods. And this was the first wild living bison. And so the, the definition here is an animal that's surviving on its own without the need for uh, veterinary care, supplemental feeding. But that's the goal here is that these animals survive on their own. The first wild bison in the UK for 30,000 years. Um, so there was a little bit of a debate about uh, when whether bison bonassas had ever been there. Bison bonassas ancestor, bison priscus, the step bison, had definitely been there 30,000 years ago. Uh, bison bonassas, there was no evidence, but uh, 30,000 years, you know, that that's a good, a good round number, I guess. So these bison are back. Uh, there was the first bison calf was born when there were no males on site. So this was a bit of a puzzle for a while. Uh, they wondered how this could have happened, but obviously what happened is one of the uh, three females that were on site had come in pregnant. Um, there is now a male on site and there has been a natural birth uh, on the site there. So the herd is now six. One of the interesting things about these this bison return is there are two fences uh, one fence is a little electric fence about a meter high that keeps the bison in. The other fence is a two meter high uh, chain link fence with wire. Uh, I forget what you call it, not razor wire, um, uh, barbed wire, <laughs> barbed wire on the top uh, to keep people out. Um, the bison is falls in British law under the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, which is a little bit odd. It's the same law that would govern what you did if you had a python or a pet tiger or something like that. Uh, but it does, uh, at the moment, govern bison reintroductions in the UK. And the people working on the project were saying, you know, we got to change this. This just doesn't kind of fit uh, with what this species actually is. In order to keep the bison put, eventually, there's sort of a vision that maybe one day they could take those fences down once the law changes, uh, and they could perhaps replace the electric fence with satellite-guided shock collars, which would be an interesting idea. These bison could roam independently, but there would be shock collars which would stop them going past a certain area. And it might be important to stop them roaming too far because those bison are four miles away from Canterbury Cathedral uh, as the crow flies or as the bison charges, I guess. Um, so we'll see what happens there in the future. Um, so all of these, the, the sperm whales, the bears, the bison, these strange accommodations, that you, these kind of improvisations that you have to do to let the species come back. The most dramatic improvisation I encountered was to help this species. And this uh, very delightfully cute owl is called the Northern Spotted Owl. And the Northern Spotted Owl has been struggling due to habitat loss. They uh, nest in broken snags of old growth trees. 
in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. There's not that many old growth trees left. And uh, until Bill Clinton and Al Gore went out there in the 1990s, what was left were getting cut down at a pretty fast rate. Um, so these spotted owls have struggled with habitat, but they've struggled now because of the arrival of the barred owl, which is a species originally in the northeastern United States that has made it across the country because of habitat changes that humans caused. So now that those barred owls have come out of the northeast and they're in the northwest, they're hammering the spotted owls. They're bigger, they're more aggressive. Uh, they're more voracious eaters. Uh, they breed better. Sometimes they will harass and even kill these northern spotted owls. And basically, one biologist described the spotted owls as circling the drain. They're really doing very badly. You can do something to help. But what you have to do is you have to shoot barred owls. And I went out on the forest with someone who had the very appropriate name of Melissa Hunt. Uh, she was part of an experiment to shoot barred owls to protect spotted owls. And I said, Melissa, how many barred owls do you think you shot? And she said, 350, probably a bit more. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book on this. Do you mind if I put that number in the book? And she said, no, it's it's OK. I mean, I know this is uh, this is controversial. Um, I've had friends come up to me jokingly and say to me, are you a member of Al Qaeda? But she says, I think I have to do it. I think if we want the Northern Spotted Owl to survive, we have to shoot barred owls. And Melissa was taking part in an experiment to see if it worked. It does work. And recently the US Fish and Wildlife Service has instigated a policy of over the next um, three decades to kill up to 500,000 barred owls to help the spotted owls survive. That's about 15,000 a year or 50 a day. So to help those Northern spotted owls survive, you would have to kill about 50 barred owls a day to give them a chance. And so this is the opposite end of the extreme from where we were before. Where we were with the whales and the wolves and the plains bison in the United States was stop killing them and they do all right. In this case, you have to be very engaged, very interventionist, very involved. And the Northern Spotted Owl is not the only species like that. Uh, the California condor is one where extensive captive breeding over many years. Um, and then even today, now that there's about 300 or so California condors in the wild, we have to go out there, bring them inside every so often to get the lead out of their blood because they're still picking up lead from uh, abandoned uh, carcasses that have shot lead shot in them. And so you have species like those spotted owls and like those California condors where you have to be very interventionist to make it work. And then you have other species where all you gotta do is give them the habitat and leave them alone. So there's no one lesson. I guess the, the, the lesson is pragmatism. You gotta be pragmatic. You gotta figure out what works in each different situation. So um, I'm going to shift now to, to another uh, part of my, my little talk here. And it's, it's shifting to that third reason that we have for telling these positive stories. And that's the reason where it can help us think differently about animals. They're back. They're here afresh. And so we have a chance to rethink them. And this is my, uh, my day job is I teach environmental philosophy at the University of Montana. And so you'll hear the philosopher in a little bit of what I'm saying here, different ways of thinking about animals. So what do I mean by that? Let's start with this example, our friendly uh, furry orange tooth rodent, uh, the beaver. It's recovering, recovering real well uh, in North America from a low of about 100,000 uh, to 15 million, in Europe from a low of about 1,000 to just over a million. And in the UK, there's all sorts of beaver restoration projects happening at the moment, including one in Sussex, uh, not so far from, from where I grew up, which is very exciting, very exciting to me. So what, what are we, how do we think differently about beavers now that they've returned? What's changed? So here's a beaver dam. Uh, this dam is actually taken, this photo is taken probably about two miles from where I'm sitting right now. 
and it's the site of a dam removal. So this big old dam came out. It came out because it was trapping a bunch of toxic sediments that had to be removed. So this, this dam didn't come out for fish. Primarily, it came out for reasons of toxicity and sedimentation. And after the human-built dam had come out, the people managing this area were terribly excited to see the beaver dam come back in. So there's a little light bulb goes on, right? Human dam out, human dam bad, take it out. Beaver dam good, uh, let's welcome it in here. We know beaver dams do a lot for the ecosystem. And so I went out on the into the woods with a PhD candidate called Andrew Law, who was studying what beaver dams do for an ecosystem. So this dam is not as impressive as, as the one I just showed you. It's a tiny little creek that you could actually step over. But you can see that the two technicians here are walking around this small barrier in this tiny creek. And what they're doing is they're taking measurements of the hydrology. Uh, they're taking measurements of the upstream water depth and the downstream water depth above and below the dam. He has some tags in fish that he is also tracking to check movement of trout through the dam uh, because beaver dams are never perfectly sealed. Uh, there's always ways for uh, fish and fry to move through them. Basically, they're studying the science of beaver dams. And here they are. They have PVC tubes in the ground, and they're measuring how far under the ground the groundwater is. So this has become an interesting science. They're learning from the beavers what they're capable of doing. And it turns out the evidence is so clear that the that beavers help restore uh, groundwater and improve the water table and improve the vegetation, that a whole industry of building beaver dams has sprung up in the United States. Um, they're called beaver dam analogs. Here's one being put in for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And I think it's fair to say the attitude towards the beaver has switched from one of, this is an, an annoying rodent that can flood my field, to this is an animal that can teach us something about how to recover a river system or how to recover a creek. And so this idea of beavers as experts and teachers, I think, is an attitude which may have always been there amongst indigenous people. Uh, but this is an attitude that is becoming more widely appreciated. So there's example one of how a returning animal can help us think differently uh, about it. Here's another example, the plains bison. So I'm out here in eastern Montana. Uh, in on a piece of land owned by an organization called American Prairie. And American Prairie have been buying up uh, ranches from willing sellers uh, at market prices and have been changing those lands over to bison grazing instead of cattle grazing. So they showed me this creek. This is called Fourchette Creek. And they've had bison on this land for about four or five years. And this creek is in pretty bad shape. You can just see the sporadic vegetation uh, in the creek. We walked down into the creek and some of those creekside trees were dying. I mean, the creek was completely dried up when we were down there. It is a little bit greener than the surrounding landscape, uh, but it's not by any means a recovered creek. But then they took me to this creek. This is Beaver Creek. And you can see immediately that it is a much greener place. So I went there in August. The day before it was 102 degrees. And I must say, I admire anyone who can make a living out there in that kind of hostile climate. In the winter, it can be 40 or 50 below. In the summer, uh, over 100. And the ranchers who've made a living out there and, and the tribal people who over generations survived out there deserve our, imagine, uh, our uh, appreciation for sure. Um, when we showed up at this uh, wetter creek, two night herons, a great blue heron, and eight American white pelicans flew off from the creek. This has had bison on it for seven years. Now, they've watched this creek recover in front of their eyes because though bison obviously need a drink when it's hot, they don't stay in the creek and munch all the vegetation in the creek. They go take a drink and then they leave. And they go back up onto the high country where their preferred food is. And by leaving the creek by not staying in there in the summer, they allow that creek to recover. 
And then we walk down into that creek and what you can see in the left of that larger photo is a beaver dam. That beaver dam has not a single uh, stick or branch in it. It is made entirely of mud and of those rushes. And so what has happened here is the bison has prepared the ground for the beaver to return. And as that creek continues to green up, the cottonwood trees will start to sprout alongside the creek and that woody uh, vegetation that the beaver obviously ultimately prefers um, for its food will start to build up and those dams will start to become uh, more typical uh, beaver dams. But you see here this very interesting role of the bison being a pioneer, an ecosystem engineer that creates the space for the beaver. So the beaver is the expert and the teacher, right? <laughs> But here the bison is playing this facilitating role. And what you need in hot places that are getting hotter in the summer is more water. Uh, if you can keep water on the landscape for longer, you're gonna be doing better. So there's a sense in which the bison and the beaver together as partners here are helping build resilience into this landscape, helping to build climate resilience into this landscape. And now that I've introduced that word climate, a number of the other species that I encountered also had impacts on climate. And so those whales that we were discussing a little bit earlier play an interesting role. And this is an emerging science still being studied on carbon sequestration. Those three images there represent whales moving nutrients, the one across the top and the one on the right, moving nutrients from northern to equatorial latitudes or from extreme southern Antarctic lat latitudes to equatorial latitudes. And on the right there, moving nutrients from the bottom of the ocean to the top, up where there's more light. They move nutrients by eating in one place and pooping in another. And that poop uh, creates phytoplankton blooms. That phytoplankton brings carbon out of the atmosphere and out of the water. Uh, that middle image, it just represents uh, the death of a large animal like a whale where the carbon that's encased in its body sinks to the bottom of the ocean. So whales play an interesting emerging role in sequestering carbon. Sea otters also play a role in sequestering carbon. There's a little chain of events here. Uh, it's the sea otters eating the invertebrates that kill off kelp forests. So if you don't have sea otters, you have such a lot of sea urchins and other invertebrates that the kelp forest can't survive. If you do have sea otters, the sea otters eat the urchins and the kelp forests come back and the kelp forests sequester carbon very quickly. And so sea otters and whales, bison and beavers play roles in the climate struggle. So here's a way one might look at those animals as partners or allies, as uh, creatures that can be, that can't solve the climate problem. And, you know, let's be clear here, um, what animals do is only gonna take a small bite out of the carbon problem, but it's it's a bite and it's, it's pointing in the right direction. And as well as getting the climate benefits, you get the biodiversity benefits. Kelp forests are terrific as nurseries for fish. Creeks in dry places, are good shelter for a whole range of birds and uh, insects and other, uh, other mammals. So here's the second way that the recovery of these animals makes us look at them different. We can look at otters and whales, we can look at bison as climate allies. Okay, I've got one more uh, and then, then we can stop for question. And this last one is one that I, I'm always hesitant to talk about, but I always end up talking about it because I, it's an important one. It's a provocative one. Uh, and I think it, it gives us room to think differently about animals. So this is the wolf and the book mainly covers the wolf in Europe. Uh, but this applies to the wolf in Europe. It applies to the wolf in North America. Um, it's been said that no animal carries more of our psychic baggage than the wolf. The wolf is an emblem of the wild, if you like. Teddy Roosevelt called them beasts of waste and desolation. There's just been a book published in, in the UK by Derek Gow, Hunt for the Shadow of the Wolf. The wolf just kind of haunts our imagination. 
The worst one is animals. If, if you leave it alone, it comes back. And its recovery has been remarkable. Uh, in the United States, it was it made its own way back from Canada in some places. So Montana is pretty interesting in that regard. Some of the first wolves back in the United States made their own way through Glacier National Park into northern Montana. And it was also helped by being brought back into Yellowstone National Park and into a wilderness area not far from here, the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness. Uh, in Europe, the wolf is back in every country in continental Europe and has been reintroduced to none of them. I always tell my students here uh, that fact. It's just remarkable that the wolf has made its own way back in Europe. In the United States, it needed help, but in Europe, it made its own way back. Um, the success of the wolf in Europe has been remarkable. And I'm going to show you a little video here. It might not be super clear, but I want you to, you're going to see these two wolves walk across the screen and then they're going to walk across slowly. And I want you to look at the difference between them. So watch carefully. Okay. Now, these wolves are different wolves from each other. I don't know if you notice any difference, but the front wolf is a little redder. The front wolf is a little smaller. If you were up closer, you would see that the front wolf's snout is a little thinner. The front wolf is an Italian wolf, Canis lupus italicus. The back wolf is a Eurasian wolf, Canis lupus lupus. You can see the name of the video on the top left there. Slav and Julieta. The wolf in the back is Slav, a Eurasian wolf, Canis lupus lupus. The wolf in the front is Julieta, an Italian wolf, Canis lupus italicus. And Slav and Julieta got together and had pups because Julieta pushed out of that growing Italian population, pushed out to the east and the north into Slovenia and towards Croatia and met Slav up there and reunited these two subspecies of wolves that have been separate for several hundred years. So wolves cross boundaries. They cross geographical boundaries, in this case, from Italy into Slovenia. Here's a wolf in Germany crossing another boundary. This wolf crossed a different boundary. He crossed the boundary from the wilderness and the wilds into farmland, into domesticated spaces. And here's another wolf in the Netherlands doing the same thing, moving from the wild or the country into the domestic. So crossing another boundary. Wolves can do that. Wolves can cross those boundaries, those, ge those geographical ones and those conceptual ones. And should that be a surprise? Well, of course not, because 15,000 years ago, wolves crossed the boundary into our lives when they became domesticated pets. So wolves have this ability, not only to live by their feet and walk across geographical boundaries, but they have this ability to move between categories. A very interesting ability that not only wolves, but other animals like bears have. This is a black bear taken on move-in day at my university in the fall of 2022. There were a lot of bears in town that fall. And this bear is literally walking onto campus alongside all the students who were also moving onto campus that day. You can see in the background there is a girl walking towards the dorm uh, with a backpack full of books. Uh, bears were crossing those boundaries between the wild world and the domestic world. Here are some more bears also on my campus here. This was just last fall in September. Uh, that picture at the bottom there, those two yearling cubs. Um, everything you can see in the back of that picture is campus where I teach. These bears are crossing those boundaries. And so like 
the wolf that I mentioned that travels long distances across national boundaries, but also travels across these category boundaries, these conceptual boundaries, the bear can also manage that. And that gives us something to think about too, as animals recover, where do animals belong? What, what are these creatures? How close to our lives can we have them? So I'm going to end with just reading another short passage from, from my book here. Um, as I got further into the book, I realized I wanted to push my mind as far as I could go in terms of thinking about the future of animals. How might we think about them differently? And towards the end of the writing, I went to look for some salmon near to where I live. So I live in the mountains, as I, as I explained. And this river picture is taken about, uh, it's probably 45 miles from here, uh, higher up in the mountains than, than where I am. And this is the Loxor River. And I learned with a bit of sleuthing and detective work that salmon returned to this Loxor River. So I went up there, somebody told me where to see them. And I saw these salmon and it was incredible because these salmon are 600 miles from the ocean. They're 3,500 feet above sea level. They haven't eaten in months. They've gone through eight massive dams to get here. And they returned to the very pool in which they were born, probably five to seven years ago. They've come back to spawn and to die. And so if there was ever a tenacious beast, these salmon were emblems of tenacious beasts. It was, it was incredibly moving to see them. It was incredibly exciting to see them. Uh, and they really pushed me, they made me think. So let me just read you this last passage and then I'm done. There's one more thought I had as I left the salmon behind that evening. There will come a day when Earth's human population will peak. It may be shortly after the middle of this century, it may be later. Up to that moment, Earth's biodiversity is grinding its way up a hill like an ancient roller coaster, slowing so much it looks like it may never make it to the top. Each loud clack is a doubt about what will be left behind. But when it does reach the crest, the long struggle against gravity will finally flip to become an accelerating free fall. Millions of bodies will slither, fly, and hop their way back onto soils and waters released from service to human needs. Recovering wildlife are the reservoirs that will fill out the green and blue spaces recoloring the map. The work we do now will be a bridge to a world we can only dream of. Trickles of possibility will become cascades of life as animals regain the room to flourish. And just as we did for thousands of years in the past, our species will start to remember an ancient wisdom born of entanglement with the lives of animals. We will find ourselves bending once again to the pull of biological forces that never fully went away. So thanks for your attention. I hope I provided some optimism. And uh, yeah, if there's time for questions, I'll do my best. Thank you so much, Christopher. That was a wonderful paragraph to end on. And I was wondering about the bears on your campus. Uh, does the university provide them with um, crossings in a way so that they find it easier to cross over like from one edge to the other? So not not on campus. They just uh, they just show up and we we get an email um as a campus safety type of measure saying a bear has been spotted please avoid this area um there is a growing in the united states there's a growing movement to provide crossings over roads uh and more money is starting to pour into that um but on campus here there's, there's nothing special done we we are careful with our, our rubbish and and try to keep campus clean but otherwise they they come and go Oh, that's good. I remember a story from South India uh, with elephants and tea plant and coffee plantations, and they devised a system of SMS alerts on phones and uh, lanterns just coming up, you know, wherever elephants have been spotted so that they can pass. Um, great. We do have a few questions, but before we move to the questions, if anybody wants to buy Christopher's book, I've pasted a UK link uh, in chat, so you could take a look at that. And since it's a talk about tenacious peace and returns and recoveries. We have two more events in the summer. One is the return of Britain's wild boar, and which is online. But we also have Derek Gao coming in person, which Christopher, whom Christopher mentioned, writing about the wolf. And that's a film screening and a panel discussion about the return of water wolves. OK, um, I will get to the questions. Um, Georgina asks, um, did the bear scat 
uh, I guess, contribute to re reconstructing the ecosystem as well by redistributing seed and fruit sources? You, you know, I think, I mean, ultimately, uh, SCAT does move nutrients around the system. And there's, I learned about a whole new area of study called zoo geochemistry, which has got a lovely name. Um, but it, you know, it's the idea that animals do take part in uh, the sort of chemistry of a system and, and animals have not been factored in so much into that chemistry uh, previously. In the case of the bear, um, there's probably not enough of them at the moment to actually make a measurable difference to the way uh, nutrients move. And I mean, certainly they will help spread seeds. I mean, you know, anytime you get a, a scat with seeds in it, you've got a nice little piece of fertilizer to, to help those seeds grow. Um, so, you know, certainly the impact will be positive. I would be a little surprised. I haven't seen any studies on this, but I would be a little surprised if bears at the kind of density they're at in the Apennines are making a measurable difference to that. Um, but, you know, certainly creatures like creatures that exist in larger numbers, like bison uh, on the Great Plains, for example, uh, certainly provide that function. Yeah, there is a bison related questions. Um, Carol asks, is all hunting of the plains bison banned? And do people adhere to a ban if there is one? So yes, people certainly adhere to, to hunting regulations. The hunting is regulated pretty well in the United States. Um, you can actually get permits for hunting bison. There's, there's a couple of places that I know of. One is the bison that come out of Yellowstone National Park. So there's a cap on the amount of bison that are supposed to sort of fit the carrying capacity of the land in Yellowstone. And, uh, the bison are always pushing to exceed that cap. I mean, they're such a prolific species. They can reproduce at 17% a year. Wow. So they're always over that cap. Uh, and there is a hunting season on bison when they leave Yellowstone National Park. Most of that hunting is done by tribes. It is mostly a, a tribal hunt. Uh, and some years it has resulted in over a thousand bison being killed. Um, the other place that I know, I mentioned American Prairie, where there were those photos of that very dry landscape. Um, American Prairie's herd is also always growing, and some of the bison that exceed carrying capacity go onto tribal reservations, but there are a limited number of hunting permits. I think this year, maybe 18 hunting permits, uh, and some of those are available to tribes, some, the majority to local hunters, and I think there's literally only two bison permits to hunters from outside the state of Montana. Uh, on those American prairie bison. So yes, limited hunting, very well regulated. We do have uh, an attendee from Wyoming and she she says, um, if you know the Wyoming Outdoor Council, you probably do. And she just mentions them. Um, Catco says that, we. I mean, I did read about this, about beavers being released in Ealing, close to London um, this year, and apparently doing quite well. Um, Mark Stephens asks, on the beaver dams, was there a change in pollutants above and below their dams? Yeah, so I, I met with somebody who works on, on beaver cohabitation, and she had done her um, doctoral dissertation on the impact of, of beaver dams on nutrient levels. Hmm. And she was particularly interested in what beaver dams do after a disturbance like a fire. So as you probably know, when you get a forest fire, you get this flood of this excess of nutrients uh, into the river, which is harmful to uh, aquatic life. So, you know, you imagine all the ash on the hillsides, the next rainfall that happens, all that ash goes into the river, and that ash goes down the river and it stifles a lot of, of life. And what um, Alexa Whipple, who did this work, uh, showed is that what those beaver dams do is they filter out those pollutants. Uh, and they make, you know, as soon as you start going through beaver dams, you start cutting those excesses uh, dramatically and, and you make the, the river habitable. For life uh, beneath his beaver dam. So yes, they certainly they certainly do play that role. Um, and uh, you know, this is one of the things we're, we're learning about what what a beaver dam or even a fake beaver dam, a beaver dam analog, 
can do for a river system. Yeah, it's quite amazing. I mean, they clearly punch above their weight, uh, beavers. I mean, for the size that they are, they have an immense impact on the ecosystem that they live in. For sure. Um, Edward Litwin asks, um, is there a brucellosis problem in some bison populations? I'm guessing that's a pathogen. Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. It's a very political question. Uh, and the National Park Service in Yellowstone has been confronting this politics for the last 20 years, last 25 years, actually, when the state of Montana sued the National Park for letting its bison leave the park and potentially bringing brucellosis uh, into the cattle herd uh, in Montana. And so that has governed park politics for a while. Now, the interesting thing about this idea that uh, bison transmit brucellosis is that the conditions have to be very uh, precise for such a transmission to occur. So it would be transmitted in the afterbirth uh, of, of a female bison. And the, the cattle would have to kind of approach that afterbirth and ingest some of it within a few hours of the birth. And th there's a sort of a famous line that a lot of pro-bison people use here is that there has never been a documented case of a cow getting brucellosis from bison. Um, now, you know, that, that line is, is subject to interpretation, I think, uh, you know, documented versus undocumented. Um, what is true is that elk carry brucellosis and elk are much more likely to be in and amongst cattle than bison are. So one of the things I learned at American Prairie is that bison and cattle have different cultures. Uh, and by culture, I mean, you know, what do they like to do socially? Who do they like to hang out with? Um, and, you know, what is true is that bison tend to stick around bison and cattle tend to stick around by, around cattle. And so really the, the, probably the largest vector for potential brucellosis transmission is elk. And the National Park Service in Yellowstone is actually currently revising their management plan in the light of new understandings of what really is the likelihood of transmission of brucellosis. And they're revising the plan in the direction of being more permissive to bison, allowing more bison in the park uh, and dialing down. The, the park used to be involved in lethal management of bison. The park is proposing to dial down that lethal management because the risk of transmission is perhaps not what they thought it was 25 years ago. So it's an interesting question. It's a very hot political issue uh, and you know, quite a very complex one. Seems like there's a PR problem between elks and bisons uh, when it comes to brucellosis. Um, yeah. Ray Heaton asks, uh, what's your view on subspecies mixing naturally, um, a current evolutionary process or potential loss of future biodiversity? That, that is a super interesting question. Uh, you know, we, we have worried in the environmental movement for a long time, we've worried a lot about uh, subspecies interbreeding and, and losing that sort of genetic authenticity of the, of the original subspecies. And then I gave an example with those wolves of, of subspecies interbreeding. And, uh, you know, certainly if that continues, the Italian wolf and the Eurasian wolf will blend a little bit. Um, I, I, I find that a difficult question to answer. Uh, I, I'm happy that Italian wolves are expanding out of their territory. And uh, in a way, it's great that they're bumping into Eurasian wolves. And it, it doesn't seem like it would make sense to want to keep them apart um, if you were you know, really trying to drill down on that genetic purity uh, type of path. So it is a, you know, I... I I don't want to go on record as saying, oh, it's great when subspecies uh, mingle and, and share their genes. Um, but it, it does, in cases like that, that there's not something here to be upset about. Um, and then, of course, you have to separate those cases where the cause of the mingling is, is more because of human effects or something we're doing wrong. And then maybe in those cases, it might be a problem. But yeah, it's a, it's a, Difficult question. It's one that an environmental philosopher, which is what I do, <laughs> uh, it's one that we, we could spend a lot of time talking about for sure.
Uh, but it's it's also, I mean, a philosophical question of control, like where do you stop or where do you start once you've already started, and which is always the case with rewilding or return or reintroduction. I mean, all of this is artificial. None of this is, I mean, much of this is not natural. So where do you stop the control um, is a question. I guess it's difficult to answer, maybe. Yeah, and I think before, actually, before I wrote this book, I was a little bit more of a sort of a purist, if you want to call it that. You know, I, I was a little bit more along the lines of, well, we've got to keep subspecies separate. We've got to keep animals away from humans. And, uh, you know, we've got to maintain their integrity. Um, and I think over the course of the book, when I saw the the different ways that we've interacted with these species, and and in some cases necessarily to keep them alive. So for example, those apples that we're pruning for those bears, you know, it's like we're involved. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've changed the habit already and we'll continue to change it through climate change. So some of my original sort of ideological purity I ideas, I think have kind of simmered down a bit. I started the same way. I was an environmental journalist and when I, was a cub reporter, I used to think, oh, animals and people should be separate. But as I travel through India and South Asia, um, it's not possible. And they do coexist very wonderfully in several parts. It's the urban people who are the problem. Um, in fact, your climate change point leads me to the next question from Alvaro Campos, uh, who says, I mean, he's pointing to the, of course, the current heat wave, which is scorching, you know, various parts of the planet. And, you know, when it comes to recoveries or when it comes to, I guess, bringing back species, you might not be bringing them back to the same environment, to the same ecosystem that they might have. So, you know, how does this impact these recoveries? Yeah, it's a super good question. And, and as I got to the end of the book, I realized I had to say more about climate change because, you know, I'm telling these good news stories but they're all coming back into a world that's different. And I mean, those salmon are a great example. You can take the dam out of the river and restore the habitat, but if the ocean conditions change so that when the salmon are out in the ocean, their food isn't there, you haven't, you haven't done anything. You know, you haven't solved the problem. So certainly climate change is a, is a big problem. But where I, I, I settled on this as far as, as species recovery is there's a sense in which having a biodiverse planet where we're surrounded by species in these complicated ecological webs. We're surrounded by uh, large populations of species that contain the genetic diversity that is going to be necessary for them to adapt to the onset of climate change. Yeah. And then we're better off. You know, we're, we're more likely to do well heading into climate change with a biodiverse landscape full of wild animals than we are heading into climate change with a very depleted set of species around us. And you know, there might be cases where animals surprise us with their adaptability. And uh, you know, again, I gotta be careful of not, not sounding like I'm naive or Pollyanna-ish here, um, but certainly there's a lot of genetic diversity in uh, genomes that is not currently utilized, you know, it's junk DNA. Um, and it might turn out that there is certain adaptation potential in species if we let them live if we let them be genetically diverse uh and then there's these species like um the whales and the beavers and the otters that turn out to be providing these um climate resilient tricks uh on our behalf if you like um you know these sort of nice surprises where the animal recovery does something for us. I'll, I'll mention one stat I learned uh, during the work, which was interesting. Um, the recovery of wildebeest in East Africa. And so the wildebeest have recovered because of the elimination or, or the great reduction in rinderpest. So they've recovered from about 200,000 to over a million. That recovery has sequestered, sequesters more carbon on an annual basis than East Africa emits on an annual basis. And it happens because the recovered wildebeest keep the brush down. And by keeping the brush down, they reduce the summer fires and the carbon emissions from the summer fires. And so that's just one of those strange cases where the animal recovery turns out to provide this incredible uh, service, this incredible ecological service. So, um, yes, it's going to be a different world. It's going to be a hard world in which to survive. But I think our odds, our odds and their odds are improved 
if we have a biodiverse, uh, intact ecosystem around us. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Is that I mean, if is it one thing that we might have learned from our past is that we forget how little we know about ecology and interactions and dependencies and hidden genes. Um, Kim Hughes is looking forward to reading your book. And she asks, is it known whether introgression from domestic cattle in plains bison impacts their ecology in any way? Yeah, so this is another super interesting question. Because there's there's been this thing in North America anyway about the purity of plains bison. And there was this big sort of detective game uh, trying to work out, well, the Yellowstone bison are probably pure. What other bison are pure? Um, and when I was writing the book, the belief was that there were still some pure populations. Since I wrote the book, a study came out from Texas A&M University saying there's no genetically pure populations of bison, of plains bison in North America. So that means every plains bison in North America has cow genes in it. All right. So the question is, does that affect their uh, ecological uh, performance? Um, what I heard, I asked a couple of questions about that. And what I heard is that there's some evidence that cattle genes in a bison uh, decreases the, the ultimate weight that that bison has. So they, they'll be a slightly smaller bison. And so one could imagine that having an impact ecologically over time. You know, if it turned out that bison herds literally shrank in terms of their, their mass, um, you could imagine that having an ecological impact. I don't know at the moment if anybody would want to say that. Um, the other impact I heard somewhere else, and these were both anecdotal, they weren't, I didn't uh, follow these through the scientific literature, is that a bison with cattle genes in it is not as cold adapted. It's not as good in a, in a vicious winter as a, a bison that's, that's a pure bison. And so again, one could... You know, that would have ecological effects if it led to more bison deaths in the winter. Uh, it would have an effect on the herd, obviously, but it would also have an effect on the, the the carrion that was on the landscape in the spring, you know, when the snows melted. So it's part, if those two effects of cattle genes are true, the, the weight one and the cold tolerance one, then one could imagine that having an ecological effect. But I, I never pursued that far enough in the scientific literature to, to say, yes, this is this is a big deal. This is happening. This is a change. But it's a super interesting question. I think that's it. We're already over eight minutes uh, from seven. But thank you so much, Christopher. This was great. And thank you for the positive stories and the nuanced review um, of the recoveries. If you're ever in London, do come over to the Linnaean Society. I know it's a little bit of an unreal experience presenting on um, a webinar where you can't see anybody else. Um, thank you for everybody else. Uh, I'll see you at our next event. Uh, do follow us on our Instagram or Twitter. And uh, if you want to share this video, Video, I will be sending you the link later on. And that's it. Have a very good night, Christopher, and to the rest of you.